Good morning. It's Jeffrey Christian of CPM Group. It's about 9.35 uh, in the morning here in New York on Friday, the 17th of February. I wanted to talk about Platinum Group Metals today. We taught, have spent a lot of time this year uh, on silver and on gold, and we've been talking about some of the discrepancies between things that people say about silver and gold and the realities of the markets. But let's turn our focus a little bit to Platinum Group Metals today. Um, the first thing is the platinum price. Our expectation has been that the platinum price, which, you know, the platinum price has spent most of the last seven years, nine years, between $800 and $1,000. A couple spikes above it, a couple spikes below it. It started showing strength in 2021. We have been saying for some time that we did think that on a longer-term basis, the price would break above $1,000 and move forcefully above $1,000 on a sustained basis and possibly move much higher. That 1400 and then again 1600 ranges that we saw back prior to 2014 um, are, are very important levels. And there are any number of investors who have a lot of platinum uh, that they were selling in 2012-13 and the first half of 2014. And then when the price fell below 1400 they stopped selling that. They did hedge for, against further price weakness on the New York Mercantile Exchange for several years, uh, but they stopped selling their physical metal. They said, you know, prices below 1400 just too low. And several of them said, we're going to wait till the price gets back to 1400 or 1600 to reevaluate our views on platinum. If the price, which has now been between $800 and $1,000 for years, uh, gets up to $1,400, that may be a good place to take profits or start selling in long-held inventories once again. And a lot of these people bought platinum between $700 and $900 prior to 2008. Um, or it may be a good time to be long platinum. I mean, if the price goes from $915, as I'm speaking to you, to uh, $1,400, there may be some fundamentals or economic reasons why I want to hold on to that platinum, thinking that it could go back up to $1,800 or $2,000, which are levels that we saw between 2008 and 2011, 2012. So... There is a lot of metal out there, but the investors have held it for 20 years now. In some cases, 15, 20 years, they seem content to hold it uh, with the expectation that the price will rise. Now, prices of all commodities are off sharply today, the 17th of February, uh, partly, I guess, because financial markets are sort of reevaluating uh, the strength in the U.S. and European economies with the idea that interest rates may actually rise more than the financial markets have thought uh, along the lines of what the Fed has been telling financial markets to expect. Um, as the beaver would say, gee, Wally, maybe the Fed knows what it's talking about. Uh, today, we've seen the price fall back to 915. Our expectation for platinum is that the price will rise and we're looking for the price to move, again, more forcefully above $1,000 over the course of the second half of this year into 2024. And I'll talk a little bit yeah. about the auto industry and the transformation of the auto industry. It's very important because, as the IEA says, if you go forward one, 10, 20, even 30 years, the highest probability is that we will still be burning petroleum products in vehicles and in stationary uh, applications, and we will still be using platinum, palladium, and rhodium to clean the exhaust of those hydrocarbons that we burn for energy. And the IEA says the major use for platinum and platinum group metals in the long term is likely to be in catalysts and catalytic converters cleaning up exhaust from hydrocarbons and not in fuel cells or other uh, energy transformation applications. But I'll talk about that toward the end. So our expectation is that the price continues to consolidate 
with an upward tilt to break above that $1,000. We've seen it tested very strongly in the first half of 2021 during the economic recovery following the lockdown and the recession that we saw in 2020. It came back off. It's gone as far as $800 a couple times uh, last year. It has been above $1,000 uh, uh, for a significant part of the time in the first six weeks of this year, seven weeks of this year. Our expectation is it doesn't necessarily run away in the next couple months, but on a longer term view, it's very uh, attractive. Now, these are CPM groups projection estimates of supply and demand. And they go back to 1976. I started collecting this kind of data in 1979, uh, and I was able to take it back three years. Um, and that's sort of the basis of most of the modern platinum group metals work. Uh, research that you'll see goes back to about 1976 because that's when we took it back to uh, in 1979, 1981. Um, you'll see here that we have surpluses of total supply, including secondary recovery, less fabrication demand in 40 of the 47 years since 1976. We do not see large persistent deficits the way platinum promoters say. We do not see deficits in the current year or in recent years. There was a deficit, a big deficit in 2014 when the South African uh, platinum industry tried to break one of their unions and they took a six month strike. And there are a couple other uh, deficits in previous decades. Platinum market runs in a surplus. Now, the surpluses back in the 80, late 80s and 90, early 90s was absorbed by South African producers, specifically the company that was then known as Rustenburg. It's now Anglo Platinum. The surpluses that you saw from 2002 to 2011 were absorbed by investors. And you can add that up and it comes up to a lot of platinum. And this is what I was saying, and you can compare that to the prices of platinum that you saw at the time. A lot of it, they started buying around $400, $500, $600. They continued to buy it at seven, eight, nine, ten. They bought it all the way up, and then they stopped buying. Platinum market is in a surplus. Don't base your platinum investment decisions on research that tells you there has been a long and yawning deficit of platinum, new supply, newly refined supply relative to fabrication demand. They throw in surrogates for investment demand so that they can say there's a deficit. That's marketing, that's not research. Let's look at palladium. I actually have two palladium prices here. One going back to 2013, like my platinum one did, uh, just to show you that, yeah, from 2013 to 2019, the platinum price, uh, the palladium price was basically uh, around, well, for much of that time, it was around $500 to $800. It started to rise around 2017 in a more persistent fashion, got over $1,000, and then in 2018, it started to make a really big run. A lot of that had to do with a combination of palladium use in, in automotive catalysts, which was very strong, palladium use and in uh, various other industrial catalysts and investment demand. And you saw the price rise very sharply. Obviously, political events ha uh, affected it. So you saw a price spike up as COVID was coming. And, and then when we saw the global lockdown, the price spiked very sharply lower. It recovered. Even though the auto industry is in bad shape uh, in 2020 because of the lockdown and, and, and in uh, 2021 because of supply chain issues due to the after effects of the lockdown, you saw the palladium price come back up. In early 2021, it rose sharply, came back off toward the end of 2021. It spiked sharply higher when Russia invaded Ukraine, and it's come back down. And for much of 2022, it has declined. 
And we see, if you look at this chart and you compare it to the previous chart on platinum, you see a mirror image. Platinum was high in 2013 and it came down and was flat for a long period of time. And it's now only starting to rise. Palladium was low for a long period of time and then it rose and now it's coming down. My next chart is just a close up of it over the last few years. And it shows you the decline in prices since really 2020, the beginning of 2022. Our expectation is that the palladium price probably has fallen pretty much what, as far as it's going to fall. We have it going sideways for the next four to eight quarters. We don't see it rising the way we expect platinum to rise, uh, but we don't necessarily see it falling uh, much more sharply. It could fall sharply because, you know, that, as I said earlier, that period of time from 2018 to 2020 one, really, you saw a lot of investors buying a lot of palladium. And they have a lot of palladium. And if they decide that it just doesn't make sense to hold palladium, they could sell it. And that could take the price further lower. Not quite sure that's going to happen. And I have to say, you know, when we started doing our research in the late 1970s, early 1980s into the PGM markets, we were telling people in the markets, we see a lot of palladium that we couldn't account for prior to 1976. And it didn't quite make sense. We couldn't quite figure out where it was unless, and I was talking to one uh, company uh, uh, that was very much involved in these trades. I said, we couldn't figure out where that metal came from or when, unless it's being held in Switzerland by really long-term investors, because we're talking about metal prior to 1976, and this is 1981, 1982. And that company said, yes, that's it. And I said, what do you mean that's it? And they said, we uh, were buying a lot of palladium from the Soviet government, and we were selling it to whoever needed it, including the auto industry in the United States, which started using palladium catalysts in 1973. Uh, but we had extra palladium, which we sold to investors who were storing it in Zurich. And they still have it in 1981. Met some of those investors. And it's very interesting because in the period, say, 1915 to 19, uh, 2015 to 2019, I met some of those investors' sons. They were still holding that palladium. They had bought it at $45 to $85 an ounce in the early 70s, and they never quite saw a reason to sell it. Sort of like Berkshire Hathaway's shares in Coca-Cola. It's been a good investment. Palladium's been a good investment too, and it's not clear that someone who bought it at $45 and has done very well with it as a, a portfolio diversifier is going to sell it because it's fallen back to 1300 or even falls further. The palladium market it has seen bigger deficits. Those deficits in 1996 through 2000, those represented uh, the tech boom, and there was a tremendous amount of palladium being used in semiconductors. When the price of palladium shot up to $1,000 in 2000, what we saw was in 2000, 2001, the semiconductor moved wholesale away from using palladium, and they started using other metals, including tantalum, which CPM Group does research on. And you saw about an 85% reduction in electronic use of palladium in one year. You also had, you see this very big spike of uh, more than 3 million ounces of an addition to inventories in 2001. That was the Soviet government taking advantage of the spike higher in prices, the price of palladium went from, you know, seven hundred dollars to a thousand dollars, and the Soviet government took the advantage of that high price to sell about three three point two million ounces. We estimate they never made it public of long-held inventories uh, to pay off some of their debt at the time. That came down. We saw surpluses from 2001 into about 2011. 
And since 2011, you had this long period of time of much tighter palladium markets, and that coincides with that rise in prices and the advent uh, and, and arrival of more investors into palladium. We've seen larger surpluses over the last few years as the auto industry starts to move away from palladium back toward platinum, as you've lost about 10% of the light-duty vehicle market to electric vehicles that don't use platinum, palladium, rhodium catalysts, um, and due to the lockdown and other problems that the auto industry has been having. Rhodium is the third metal. A highly specialized market. It's not traded on any exchange, so it's even more obscure than gold, silver, platinum, palladium. The price shot up to about $30,000 a couple years ago because, in our view, the palladium, the rhodium market basically was running out of rhodium. Here you had deficits. You had deficits from 1981 when the U.S. auto industry started using rhodium in three-way trimetallic catalysts because the rhodium could clean up the nitric and nitrous oxide exhaust in catalyst in auto exhaust that was not required to be cleaned up from the introduction of emission standards in 1973 for the 1974 model year until 1981. In that early period, you didn't have the NOx emissions uh, being cleaned up, but in 1990. At 81, you did start to see NOx emission regula uh, regulations kick in, and the auto industry started using rhodium. And from then until now, they have been the major use of rhodium, and they've squeezed out a lot of other uses, either going from, you know, some applications went from 20% rhodium alloys to 10% to 5%, and maybe even lower now. Others just moved away from rhodium. Some of them started plating stuff with ruthenium instead of rhodium. So there was substitution away in the non-auto industry, and the auto industry basically squeezed these guys out. And around 2020, it seems to us that much of the above-ground inventories in rhodium were gone. Price shot up. The auto industry cut back. It also had the lockdown and, and a precipitous drop in sales. And we've seen about three years worth of surpluses building up, rebuilding some of those inventories to a small extent. Our projection, I don't know why it's in gray and not red. I don't know how to deal with uh, Excel that way. I guess I have to go back and relearn that sort of stuff. Our expectation is that you will see a deficit again this year. And the rhodium market will remain tight and the rhodium price will remain high. Not $30,000, but relatively high. I want to talk a little bit more about the energy transition. Now, I'm going to be giving a talk at the PDAC in early March in Toronto on energy transition and its effects on metals. I'm going to be giving another talk later in the second quarter uh, at the Society of Mining Engineers here in New York. Uh, we just did a article on for Mining Weekly, uh, which you can go on to Mining Weekly on the internet, and you can probably find the article for free talking about this. And there's a lot of hype that the platinum group metals are going to be used in fuel cell vehicles and fuel cells and uh, electrolysis of, of 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 water into hydrogen for hyd for use in fuel cells. And none of it really holds up to technical scrutiny. The platinum industry in South Africa has been projecting massive uses of platinum in fuel cells really since I got into it. You know, this first projection was in 1980, and they were saying that by 1988, we'd be using more than 300,000 ounces of platinum in fuel cells. And in fact, we were using maybe two or 3,000, mostly in research models. We're up now probably around 40 or 50,000 ounces of platinum uh, of platinum being used in fuel cells now, maybe less than that. But the South African platinum industry keeps talking about, you know, 300, 400, 500, 600,000 ounces of platinum being used in fuel cells, always like eight to 10 years forward. They're not particularly viable technically. 
still. They're not economically viable. Uh, fuel cells manufacturers have engineered platinum out of models, so they actually could stop using platinum in fuel cells. And the auto industry says, look, if you can get hydrogen safely and cheaply shipped, stored, and distributed, we would rather use hydrogen engines than fuel cells because hydrogen engines are very cheap to build. They're very easy, low maintenance type of things. They have been around for centuries. The first internal combustion engine, the proof of concept of an internal combustion engine in 1806 used hydrogen as a fuel. And the auto industry says, if you can get me cheap and safe hydrogen at the distribution point, we would rather have cars with hydrogen engines, which have no, uh, the, the only exhaust is water vapor and nitrogen, not nitric oxide, not nitrous oxide, nitrogen, as in the air. Um, so we don't see a big use for platinum in fuel cells, but you don't have to believe us. You can go to the International Energy Agency and download their reports on the internet, big reports on future uses of future energy and future uses of metals and energy, and they have the same view. And it's becoming increasingly popular and widespread. These are actually the IEA uh, projections, and you can see by 2050, they still have oil as the major source of energy. And they have natural gas as the second source. And renewables, excluding hydrocarbon and uh, other things, will be a third largest use source of energy, supplanting coal only after 2040. So the takeaway is we're going to be burning hydrocarbons for the foreseeable future. We will not achieve the zero carbon guideline set out in the Paris Accords. Projections of getting rid of gasoline powered cars by 2030 or 2035 are unrealistic. They are what we call aspirational goals or guidelines or regulations, they won't be reached. And 30 years from now, we'll still be using a lot of platinum, palladium, and rhodium to clean up the exhaust from vehicles. This is our projection to 2050 of the mix of vehicles. And it's kind of hard to tell, but the blue stuff at the bottom are um, gasoline-powered vehicles. And the maroon stuff at the top are diesel vehicles. And you can see you know, in 19, 2010, 2020, that the vast majority of vehicles are either gasoline or diesel powered. And we do see electric vehicles, BEVs are the lighter blue part. And we do see some a very small uh, number of hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. And we see hybrids, which are the brownish part in between the gasoline and the BEVs. We see them gaining market share. And by 2050, we think that those might represent almost half of the vehicles that are being made and sold in the world. But another 40%, 45% will still be gasoline-powered vehicles. And diesel vehicles will still represent something probably less than 10%. So that's our view of the energy transition. Yeah, it's happening, but there are too many constraints that it, it can't go as fast as we, uh, as a lot of people would like to, uh, to, and as it needs to, from an environmental perspective. You can buy our yearbooks. You can pre-order them on our website, cpmgroup.com, $160 each. Uh, a lot of the data I just showed you comes from our yearbooks. You can go to our website, read about them, read about other things, download free reads, watch past videos, and we will talk to you soon. Goodbye.